Thank you, Brother Voss, and you may be seated. It is a pleasure to be here today. I have appreciated very much the spirit of worship, the spiritual hunger that has evidenced itself, and I've, I've just really enjoyed the service thus far. I commend Brother and Sister Foss and Sister Shailene for doing a great job of leading you folks into spiritual pursuits and helping you as you open your hearts to God to allow his spirit to minister effectively in your lives. And uh, it's, it's really exciting to come back to a church and see very obvious signs of spiritual progress and growth and it, it's just great to see the kingdom of God blessed and see people growing spiritually and numerically. It's good to be in the house of God today. Why don't we give God a good hand clap of praise? I really appreciate uh, your pastor, and I appreciate his spirit. As a young man, he had one of the finest spirits that I've ever experienced out of a teenager, just a great attitude, and so it really is no surprise to see that God's hands on them here and God's doing a good work. We appreciate them very much, and all of the staff I know that works hard and then couldn't have a good service without saints that open their hearts, lift their hands, and open their voices in praise and love and worship to God. There's a passage in the Old Testament dealing with uh, Moses and the children of Israel as they are journeying from bondage to deliverance and hopefully to reach the promised land. Moses deals with a lot of negative issues as he tries to lead these folks to the place that God has already prepared for them. And in the midst of this journey, one day there's a decision made that Moses and Aaron can't do this alone. They've got to have some help. So I believe that there were 70 men that were appointed to be elders assistance to Moses to help with the people who had needs and the Bible puts it kind of like this that God took of the spirit that he had put upon Moses and he put it on these leaders and when that spirit touched their lives the Bible said they began to prophesy the Spirit of the Lord moved upon them mightily. And the 70 that were receiving this must have been greatly excited about the touch of God, a new dimension in God, a place they had never experienced before. And Joshua was made aware of this. A couple of men came running to him and said, these men are all excited and they're prophesying. Let's get Moses so Moses can stop this. And Joshua went to Moses and he explained what was happening. And Moses' response to Joshua's concerns was, Would God that not only the 70 but that everyone in the camp of Israel had the Spirit of God upon them. If every one of us would open our hearts to the Spirit of God, I wonder what God could do. If everyone would allow the anointing of the Spirit to flow in their lives, I wonder what God would do in this place. Why don't you lift your hands and say, God, let it Fall on me. 
every season that I have traveled through every valley I've walked through when I couldn't see a reason for the battle it was your it's brought me through for oh, your grace is sufficient for oh, your grace is sufficient hallelujah I lift my hands in praise Your grace is sufficient. Hallelujah. I lift my hands in praise. Oh, every day there is grace. Hallelujah. So, Jesus. Lead me through the trials. Just cover me, Lord, in the rain. For only your hand can keep me every mile. All for your glory and your grace. Hallelujah, I lift my hands in praise every day, there is grace. Let's give God just a little more special attention. Would you lift your hands and your hearts with your voices and say, God, thy will be done. Would you do it right now? Father, I pray that your will would be done in the remainder of this service, that our hearts can connect with your heart, that our wills would bow to your will that your purpose would become our purpose and that each of us would accept responsibility for our part of the kingdom of God. God, would you direct us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. While you're standing, I would like to read from the book of Luke, chapter 15. And many of you will find this a very familiar setting. The 15th chapter of Luke deals with a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. And I will begin reading with verse 17. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with a husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, Father, 
I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and no longer worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet afar off or a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Now, Father, we love your word. We respect your word. We live by your word. And I pray that it would become alive in our hearts today. And we'll praise you for your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. I will endeavor to be fairly brief with this message today. But I felt this on my heart. I was awakened early this morning, earlier than I wanted to be, and couldn't get back to sleep, so I thought, well, why waste the time? And so I spent time in prayer and meditation, contemplating the work of God and service today and this passage of Scripture. I'm sure that you have heard this preached many times, and I have used this scripture as a foundation for many messages that I've preached. Recently, doing a little more study on this, I saw some things that I had never really seen before in this passage of scripture, and I, I feel that that these thoughts are very applicable to our time. Uh, we're, we're living in a strange day. I fear for our nation. In all of my years and growing up, I've had a tremendous uh, patriotic feeling towards our nation. I have loved the fact that it really was a nation of religious freedom that men could express their feelings and their thoughts and, and uh, that was constitutionally, a constitutionally guaranteed privilege that we could express those thoughts. I would not have believed 20 years ago that our nation would be where it is today if someone had told me where we are and what's happening. And politically correct speech is fast becoming the, uh, the socially acceptable speech. And anyone that dares get outside the lines of politically correct speech finds themselves uh, abused, chastised, condemned, mocked, and threatened. It happened here in your city just a few months ago. And I see, I see the loss of responsibility for actions, for decisions, and even for life. And we have come to a place where we are no longer uh, feeling the necessity to take responsibility for our lives. There's a great push, a whole lot of power is given to trying to get you to believe that you don't need to worry about your health, about your finances, about your life's decisions. Just turn it all over to the government. 
and the decisions will be made for you. I don't have time today to deal with all of the negative aspects that I see developing in our nation and especially as prevalent among the young today. And I think that one of the greatest things that can ever happen to an individual is the day they realize that they have tremendous responsibility for their own happiness, for their, their uh, provisions, for their education, for their relationships. They just, if this, this action, this attitude of taking responsibility has been stripped from our minds and our thinking to the point that we hardly are willing to accept responsibility for life anymore. If anything goes wrong, it's somebody else's fault. If something is not fixed, it's because someone else didn't fix it. If life isn't good, it's because somebody threw you a curveball. If you're not happy, it's because somebody did something to rob you of your happiness. Folks are losing very quickly the responsibility of taking charge of their lives and relying upon their own ability to make decisions. And because they don't make decisions, they find themselves in trouble again and again and again. And so as I looked at this story afresh, when this young man had gone to the very bottom of life and he was hungry, he was miserable, his clothes were tattered, his friends were gone, there was no one to step up and say, I'm going to take care of you. The passage said that he would have eaten the same food they were feeding the pigs, but no man gave it to him. No man gave it to him. It was at this point in life that one of the greatest things that could happen to an individual happened to him that day. In the midst of his desperate feelings, he suddenly realized that he had left a home, a home that had all that he needed, a father who had servants, who had bread and to spare. There was an abundance. He did not wait for an invitation to come back home. He said, I will go home. I will apologize. I will acknowledge to my Father and to God that I have made a mess of my life. I will acknowledge the fact that I am a sinner and that I've made choices in life that have been destructive. I've made choices that I'm paying for now, and I'm bankrupt because I have nothing left to pay with, and there's no place I can go except to go back home. I don't know what had driven him from home. I don't know what there was about home that caused him to long for, to desire a world that was foreign to the world that he was born into. I don't know what caused him to leave. I don't know what prompted him to waste his substance on riotous living. It may have been in addition to some desires that would not have met approval by his parents. It could also have been that he didn't want to take responsibility for the family farm or business, that he didn't want to become responsible. He just wanted to take what he could get and go out 
and live life without responsibilities. The lack of responsibility put him into a life of poverty. A life of lack of responsibilities put him into a life without family, without friends, and his life was a mess. When he came back home, it's a beautiful story. It's worthy of time and effort, but I'm going to speed through it today. He received a welcome home that he probably had not expected. And when his father embraced him, he was quick to say that I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be a son. Just make me a hired servant. But his father said, this won't work. If you're going to come back to this house, if you're a part of this family, you're going to have to take on the mantle of responsibility. And so the Bible said that the father put a ring on his hand. There is, there is a very strong opinion among some Bible scholars that that ring was not just an ornament, but that it was a signet ring. It was used to stamp documents. And when that, that signet ring was stamped on a document, it would be like you signing a legal piece of paper today. And the father said, if you're coming back home, you're not going to be a hired servant, but you're going to take responsibility, and you're going to have the backing of the family. And so there are two great things that happen when a person is willing to accept responsibility. Number one, when you accept responsibility, then you have the backing of the resources of your family. It's all there. If he stamped that ring on a document, then all of the resources of that family was going to back up whatever that document talked about. We finally come to God when we wake up that we need something besides our own clever ideas. We need something besides our sensual mentality. We need something besides a Saturday night party and drugs and whatever else life might throw at us. And we're willing to come back to the family of God and accept responsibility to become a child of God. There is no greater decision that an individual can make than to accept responsibility as a child of God. I don't want to belabor the point nor drag out the sermon. I remember one time when I was just maybe preteen, or maybe I just turned 13, somewhere around there. I had heard that a church uh, had, had called a, an all-night prayer meeting. And so I went to my dad, and I said, Dad, I understand that they're going to have an all-night prayer meeting. I told him what church. I said, why don't you announce one here? Why don't we have an all-night prayer meeting here? And my dad wasn't one to sit down and listen closely to my advice at that stage of life. Even though it was very wonderful, good advice, he for whatever reason, he just didn't seem to appreciate uh, my good thoughts. And I've never forgotten his expression nor his words. He looked at me and said, well, Jim, if you're that interested, 
in having an all-night prayer meeting, why don't you have one? Isn't it interesting how that we rely on the church to lead us in every path? It isn't that the church isn't leading, but isn't it interesting how that we wait for the church to lead us into spiritual commitment, into doing something for God? We wait for the pastor to announce a program or a plan or something that would get us involved in these things. And maybe we even hear about other churches that are doing things, and maybe the local church is not doing it, and, and we get a little frustrated and wish our church would do that. You know, isn't it time that we stopped wishing and started acting? Isn't it time if, God is, if God's dealing with you? You know, I'll tell you the difference between God dealing with you and your own human nature taking charge. When God deals with you, there is a strong impulse to get busy and do it without waiting for anybody else to initiate action. It's time to get busy for God. And when we are motivated by our own frustrations, then we know that this is not God. This is just our frustrations. I say if we want to have a prayer meeting, we don't have to wait for the pastor to call an all-night prayer meeting. It's time for somebody to say, prayer is going to help the church, and so I'm going to pray. I thought about David. We've at times almost worn David out by using him uh, as an example, but I couldn't help but think about David when I began to think about this, this idea of taking responsibility. David was just a young man, so young, so inexperienced, that his father did not even consider him worthy of becoming king over Israel. When there was no one around to look on or give applause or commend him for his good deeds, David was watching his father's sheep, and there was a lion and a bear that came after a lamb. Now, how valuable could one lamb be compared to all the rest of the flock? I have no idea how large the flock was. But when David saw that lion and that bear coming after a lamb, something came over him. Something came over him. It's like I heard Brother Raymond Woodward preach a message not too long back. He was talking about a lady and her long hair and having power with that long hair, that uncut hair that God had given her. But he made a statement that impacted my heart. He said, when that lady understands her relationship with God and she understands what that commitment to God does for her, said when she goes to prayer and she starts praying for her family and she has given herself she has taken responsibility for her relationship with God. And she prays and she says, Devil, not my home, not my family, not my children, not my husband. There is something about that taking responsibility for her relationship with God that opens the door for anointing and power. Not my home. Folks, it's time somebody begin to take responsibility for the kingdom of God. Glory to God. This is not a time for the church to be pushed back in a corner. This is not a time for a preacher to have to be politically correct. As he preaches the word of God, it's time for somebody to get responsible 
for the kingdom of God. Give God a hand clap of praise. It's time, it's time for young people to fight back against the powers of the enemy. It's time to not give in to the pressures of life, but to become responsible in your relationship with God. You say, but everybody else is engaged in it. Well, that's the problem with life. The Bible speaks of a broad way. Many are on that broad way, and they're rushing. One time I was praying, and I closed my eyes, and I could almost see the rush on that broad way as it created a vortex. And the closer you get to the broad way, the more pull the vortex of the world has on you. The farther you get away from it, the less effect it has on you. You know, the pastor can't live for God for you. Your youth leader can't live for God for you. Somebody's got to say, I am going to serve God. I'm going to live for God. I don't care what anybody else is doing. Glory to God. Glory to God. It's time that we understood that there's a place for individual responsibility in the kingdom of God. When David ran an errand for his father and went to the battlefield and he heard the loud challenge of the giant, send me a man to fight me. David, I am sure, was disappointed when he didn't see one of his brothers take up the challenge. And then he looked around and the king was hidden in his tent. Nobody accepting the challenge. David could have delivered his brother's lunch to them and turned and headed back home. But there was something that rose up in him that same spirit that said, that may be a little lamb, but that lion's not going to get a one of my father's flock. <laughs> it may be small and not worth a lot, but the enemy's not going to get it. And he stood there waiting for somebody to answer it. And when nobody did, here's the shepherd boy. He's never been trained to use a sword. He doesn't know how to use a shield. He's never had a helmet on his head, probably. But he feels something burning inside. I'm not trained for fighting. But there's fighting in my spirit. You see, when, when God let Samuel know that none of the other brothers were the right one. And then he asked David's father, do you have one more son? Well, yeah, I've got a little lad out in the field tending the sheep. God said something that has been abused and been misused and taken out of context more times than we'd have the ability to count. The Bible said that God said that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. How many times have you heard somebody justify dressing immodest or whatever, and they justify it with that scripture? I've heard that used so many times. In that context, that isn't what it's talking about. It's not talking about the way you dress. It's talking about what's in your heart. Man looks on the outward appearance. King Saul was head and shoulders above every man in the kingdom. And yet when it came to this critical moment, when the future and the freedom of Israel was at stake, 
King Saul kept himself to his tent, afraid to face the challenge and ashamed to face his soldiers. And he may have been big. He may have been muscular. He may have been cut as much as any man you would ever look on. But there was no strength in his heart. He couldn't understand the value of walking out there and facing that giant. The risk was too great for him. But David, not as large as Saul, maybe not as large as his brothers, but David said, is there not a cause? He couldn't stand the fact that that giant was making fun of the God of Israel and of Israel and that he stood there mocking them. And David said, I'm going to take responsibility for this. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there were people in the church who understood the powers of the enemy, the daily assault for the church by the enemy, the challenge against the church? Wouldn't it be wonderful if people would rise up and say the enemy is not going to affect my church? The enemy is not going to stop this church from moving forward. Pastor's not going to have to call a prayer meeting. I've got an extra hour. I'm going to find myself a place to pray, and I'm going to pray until the anointing is flowing, until God's giving us victory. Glory to God. Not too long back, there's a lady in our church that fell and when, when it was found out and she was confronted with her failure, she began to accuse the pastor of not warning her, which was not true. In other words, she was not willing to take responsibility for her sins. She wanted to lay the blame on somebody else. I wonder how that would have gone over with Joseph or Daniel and the three Hebrew children. I wonder how that excuse would have sounded to them because when Joseph had been betrayed by his brethren, sold into slavery, wound up in a strange land, and his boss's wife began to make passes at him. Nobody there knew him except as a slave. And yet, when he faced that, he didn't look to the betrayals of his brethren, the betrayal of Potiphar's wife, or anybody else to give him an excuse for failing God. But he said, how can I do this thing? against my God and against my boss. How can I do this? In other words, he was willing to take responsibility. He did not allow life circumstances to give him an excuse. Would you think about that for just a moment? So many times we rely on circumstances to excuse us and to let us weaken our relationship with God. I'll never forget the story of uh, a man that was mildly handicapped, and he took that as an excuse to beg for money. He stood outside a, a mine and with a cup in hand, and as folks passed by, some would drop coins in, and then... He looked up, and here came a man in much worse condition than he was in. And that man was holding down a full-time job, and he reached up and dropped some coins in his cup. And I, I, I just wondered about that, how, how we would feel when we make excuses 
You know, so many times we're looking at life circumstances as an opportunity to do the thing that we really want to do, and then we excuse our failure or our weakness on the fact that life circumstances has caused me to do this. You know something? We don't live for God because of circumstances. We live for God in spite of circumstances. We live for God because we've made up our minds that we're going to serve Him. We live for God because He means more to us than anything in the world would ever mean to us. It's time to take responsibility. It's time to say this is between me and God. It's time to say, God, I want to serve you with all of my heart. I want to be as effective as I can be in the kingdom of God. It's time to stop saying, I can't make it. There's too much. It's time to say, by God's help, I can do all things. And isn't that Bible? I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Glory to God. Would you stand? Thank you for your attention today. And I wonder if you would just open your hearts right now. Maybe there's a young person been battling, and maybe God could speak to your heart and say, I'm just going to serve God with all of my heart and reject all the pressures of life. Maybe there's somebody else here that God's been dealing with, and you've been waiting on somebody to, to initiate action. Maybe it's time for you to initiate some actions, prayer, soul winning, and teaching Bible studies or whatever God might be leading you to. Maybe it's time for you to say, God, I want to do my part. I wonder if you would just close your eyes and lift your hands right now and say, God, I want you to direct my steps. I want you to lead me. I want you to use me. I offer myself to you today. Would you pray it? Open your hearts. Open your mouths. Would you pray it?